Sheila was, was supposed to be giving this uh, presentation, but she had a last minute conflict, so Cyril asked me to step in uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm pleased to be sharing the work that I did. A lot of this work came from the, uh, my graduate training, so it's really what Sheila's been doing, but I was privileged to be a part of it. First, I want to start by saying that we have not received support from any of the specific sponsors of this program, but some of the studies that I'll be reviewing were supported in the form of investigator-initiated research grants to Dr. West at Penn State University. However, the sponsors were not involved in the study design, analysis, interpretation, or dissemination of the results. So let's get started. This audience is well familiar, well acquainted with the global perspective on diabetes and the related uh, burden of cardiovascular disease, so I'm not going to inundate you with more statistics. However, I am going to state that part of our challenge, especially for those of us in nutrition research, is that cardiovascular disease takes years to develop. And many of the studies that we do, particularly the efficacy controlled feeding studies, can't go on for years and years and years until we get hard outcomes. Also, not all of the patients who develop cardiovascular disease have the traditional risk profile. So what we really need are a way to assess short-term changes in cardiovascular risk that still have prognostic significance, but that we can see after small dietary changes to see if we're actually having a benefit. The traditional risk factors for diabetes are excuse me, for cardiovascular disease listed here, age, gender, male gender, older age, dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and smoking, show up in many people who have CVD, but not everybody. Even though this data is old, it's about 20 years old by now, um, at least 25% of individuals at this time did not have any of these risk factors at the time of their first coronary event. So what I'm going to focus on today are some of the more novel risk factors that we can use in nutrition studies to see if these short-term dietary changes have any other effects. I'm also going to explain some of the discrepancies that we may have seen in other literature. So let's start with ambulatory blood pressure. I'm not surprised there actually hasn't been much talk about blood pressure today, particularly with regard to nuts. However, in 2011, uh, several colleagues here wrote a review of nuts, hypertension, and endothelial function. And at the time, there had been about 20 studies that looked at clinical trials that looked at blood pressure and nut consumption. And they concluded that the results were mostly inconclusive. Most of them ended up being null. However, they also stated that at the time, there were no studies looking at ambulatory blood pressure. Now, all of us sitting here in the room are pretty stable. Our blood pressure is probably not moving around very much, except for me being up here. But all of our patients go through many different things during the day that causes their blood pressure to go up, down, move around. When we measure their blood pressure in the clinic, it just gives us a snapshot in not a very realistic environment of what their blood pressure is. And measuring blood pressure throughout the day can give us a better idea of what their blood pressure is really like, and it's also a better predictor of target organ damage than a clinic blood pressure reading. So for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar with this approach, it involves a patient wearing an ambulatory monitor on their arm attached to a small device that they wear on their hip, and it takes blood pressure readings about every 20 minutes throughout the day and a little, bit, little less frequently at night. In this example here, a great thing about blood, ambulatory blood pressure is it can differentiate between wake hours and sleeping hours. In this example, the blood pressure throughout the day is about 115 over 70. During the day, though, it's 116 over 75. And at night, we see an average blood pressure about 102 over 57. So this is a 12% drop in systolic blood pressure. This concept known as dipping is also an indicator of cardiovascular risk. What we want to see is people's blood pressure going down while they're sleeping. Their body's at rest. They're not supposed to be stressed out. In contrast, people who do not exhibit dipping, they don't have any of this drop, tend to have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. 
Now, with regards to nuts and ambulatory blood pressure, again, at the time of the 2011 review, there were no studies looking at ambulatory blood pressure. But now, in 2014, there were actually three studies that were published on ambulatory blood pressure in nuts, including one from our group at Penn State. The first one was the cyst diet study, which was discussed earlier this morning. And I want to point out that this is specifically done in metabolic syndrome, and this was done in a subset of the study. It was only in the Denmark site that they conducted this ambulatory monitoring procedure. They gave the, excuse me, in this study, they recommended the Nordic diet, which included some nuts, and they did do some supplementation with nuts. And they found that although baseline blood pressures were 125 over 76, they did not see any change in systolic blood pressure, but a significant drop in diastolic blood pressure in looking at the overall daily pattern. And most of that actually came from a drop during the day. There was no difference in the circadian patterns at night. The second study for the 201st time today is PREDIMED. And this one, um, you're all well familiar with that. In this specific sample, it did include about a third of the sample who were type 2 diabetes specifically. The rest were just in the risk factor group. And this one was 12 months long, so a bit longer than the Nordic diet study. And this one found a drop in both systolic and diastolic in their ambulatory monitoring, but no difference in the circadian pattern. So it was about similar throughout the day. Lastly, I want to present the, one of the studies that we did at Penn State. We refer to this as our pistachio diabetes study because it was testing the effects of pistachios in type 2 diabetes. This was also a subset of the study. And let me just mention that the PREDIMED ambulatory monitoring was only done at the Barcelona and Sevilla sites. It was not throughout the entire study as well. And ours, for the same, ours was also, our total sample size was 30, but we only got the ambulatory monitoring in two thirds of that, about 21 people, due to the availability of the monitors. Our study was a crossover controlled feeding, so in contrast to the other two, which were supplemental and dietary advice, we actually provided breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything to these participants. And we found a significant drop in systolic blood pressure, and most of that drop actually came from what happened overnight. So to summarize the ambulatory data, what we're seeing is all three studies that have been done in, on ambulatory blood pressure and nuts showed a, drop in, showed a drop in blood pressure. Now this is small, only about two to four millimeters of mercury. Keep in mind that most of these studies were short. Ours was the shortest at four weeks. PREDIMED was the longest at 12 months. But even a drop in blood pressure at this level on a population-wide scale there have been reports that a two millimeter drop in blood pressure can re reduce cardiovascular or stroke mortality about, by about five to eight percent. And the drop that was seen in the Nordic diet, in the cyst diet study of five millimeters of mercury in diastolic blood pressure is associated with a 22 percent drop in coronary heart disease mortality and also a 40 percent drop in stroke mortality. So again, these differences are small, but on a population level, just by integrating nuts, that could have potential public health implications. And I also want to point out that these ambulatory results differed from the clinic results that each of these studies reported. The pistachio study at Penn State, the cyst diet, and the overall study, all of them stated, both of them stated that there was no effect on clinic blood pressure. So if we had just stopped there, we would have concluded, like most of the other earlier studies, nuts don't affect, affect blood pressure. PREDIMED study did not have a significant effect on clinic systolic blood pressure. Clinic diastolic was reduced a little bit, but it was not nearly the, to the degree that we saw in this ambulatory monitoring. So in that sense, in doing future research on nuts and blood pressure, I would strongly consider investigators to include ambulatory monitoring so they can get a better sense of what's going on. Along the same lines, let's delve into blood pressure a little bit more. We talk a lot about blood pressure, but blood pressure is defined by the underlying systemic hemodynamics, which get much less attention. Blood pressure is defined by the balance between total peripheral resistance, or vascular resistance, and cardiac output. Cardiac output, more specifically, is made up of heart rate and stroke volume. So when we see a change in blood pressure, it can be useful to understand what is it that's actually changing. Is peripheral vascular resistance going down? Is cardiac output going up? So that we can get an idea of what's going on more on the underlying level. In Dr. West's lab, we do this with a technique, a non-invasive technique called impedance cardiography. We, we place these mylar bands around the neck and around the abdomen, and we measure differences in, in impedance 
in thoracic impedance every time the heart beats. With this me measure, we're able to estimate stroke volume. We use electrocardiograms to simultaneously or excuse me, measure heart rate. From that, we can, um, from that we can measure or calculate cardiac output. We also me measure blood pressure with an external monitor and then back calculate total peripheral resistance. So this can give us a better idea of what's going on in the overall patient instead of just looking at the one blood pressure number. And in Dr. West lab, we often do this both at rest and during mental stress tasks to give us a better idea of what may be going on in the external environment. Dr. West has run three different studies at Penn State with nuts using impedance cardiography, and they were all crossover controlled feeding studies. The first two, the walnut study and the pistachio dose study, were done in adults with high cholesterol. And the last one, the pistachio diabetes, again, was done in type 2 diabetes. I'm going to go over these a little quickly, um, just in the interest of time. You can see the details there while I'm talking. But the bottom line that I want to point out here is all three studies showed a significant reduction in total peripheral resistance. They all showed a significant increase in stroke volume and cardiac output, resulting in pretty much a non-significant change in overall blood pressure. So while our conclusions from this study is nuts, from these three studies collectively, is nuts don't change blood pressure, they do modify the underlying hemodynamics, so something is going on physiologically. Continuing in the line of vascular resistance, I want to talk a bit about endothelial function. It's been mentioned in a few of the talks. It's a concept that may not be um, very familiar with all of you. So the endothelium is the single layer of cells that lines the interior of the blood vessels. And it's very important for anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and vasodilatory functions in the body. Now, we care most about endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries. We want to make sure that the heart is getting the oxygenated blood that it needs, that there's not blood clots, thrombus, any problems there. But it's very difficult to measure coronary endothelial dysfunction. Angiography is invasive, it's risky, and it's not suitable for routine use in the clinic or in the majority of the research studies that the nutrition scientists here conduct. An alternative is brachial flow-mediated dilation, and this was first presented by David Sellermeyer back in the 90s, where it's a non-invasive procedure, I'll explain in more detail in a minute, that is able to look at endothelial function in the brachial artery. It correlates well with coronary endothelial dysfunction. It has prognostic significance in being able to differentiate who will and will not have a future event. But it can be technically challenging to do. As someone who's been involved in over 200 FMD tests during my graduate career, I can tell you it's, it's very intensive, there's a lot of labor involved, and it's difficult to be consistent from study to study. So a newer, potentially alternative method for measuring endothelial function is peripheral arterial tonometry, abbreviated PAT. This method is done digitally, so it's a probe that goes on the finger. Again, I'll show more details in a moment. And here the evidence is a bit more mixed. Some studies show that it is correlated with coronary endothelial function. Some say it is cor correlated with FMD, and others say not. What's most likely happening is it's evaluating, compared to FMD, it's evaluating distinct parts of the vasculature and distinct underlying functions. However, there has been at least one study that used it in an ambulatory clinic to predict future events. And what's appealing for researchers about this over FMD is that it is operator independent, it is very easily standardized between laboratories, and it is less labor intensive to conduct. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of administering FMD tests, I'm just going to briefly go through how this is done. First of all, we induce a flow stimulus by putting a blood pressure cuff on the forearm, usually on the fore lower forearm, inflating it to above systolic blood pressure to cut off all blood flow to the hand. We leave it inflated for five minutes, and then we release that blood flow, and the ischemia that resulted in the hand leads to a flow stimulus or a reactive hyperemia, increased blood flow, through the brachial artery. The endothelium in the brachial artery senses that increased blood flow, releases nitric oxide, which causes the underlying smooth muscle cells to relax or to dilate, and that's why we get dilation. So you can see here the artery is dilating. 
We use ultrasound to measure the, the diameter of the brachial artery. We do it right up on the forearm, up on the upper arm, and then we use an automated software that is able to detect the borders on the brachial artery. We can measure that both at rest or at baseline before we induce the occlusion and the hyperemia and then also afterwards. We measure the difference between the baseline and the peak. We use that to calculate percent FMD. The higher your percent, the more, the better your endothelial function. Now, briefly on peripheral arterial tonometry, the overall procedure, the overall concept is the same. And in Dr. West's lab, we actually do both of them simultaneously. We have the ultrasound on one arm and then the fingertip probes on the other arm or excuse me, on both hands. And so we've got a control arm at the top, which is showing us um, what's happening, on in, hope, happening in the arm that does not have the cuff occlusion. We've got these fingertip probes that have balloon-filled filled catheters that are able to pick up the pulsations in the finger every time the heart beats. And then we can see the difference. Here is at baseline, this is occlusion, and then we release that cuff and we see the reactive hyperemia and the increased amplitude. Calculation is here, and it's multiplied by a baseline correction factor to give us the reactive hyperemia index. Kind of similar to FMD percent, a higher number indicates higher endothelial function. Now, let's get to the studies, now that you have understand the procedure. In, for, there have been more studies in FMD than in endopat. And in these populations that I'm listing here, healthy adults, those with high cholesterol, overweight or obesity, and metabolic syndrome, the studies have mostly been positive, more so with regard to walnuts and a few on pistachios and hazelnuts. The mixed nut study that's been done um, was not significant. And there may be more studies um, referring to these that I'm, or that have looked at these that I don't have included here. But for the most part, nuts and FMD is pretty positive. Endopat is not nearly as positive. In healthy adults or people with metabolic syndrome, walnuts, pistachios, and mixed nuts were all shown to not have any effect on reactive hyperemia index. Now, specific in people with type 2 diabetes, there have been two studies that have looked at endothelial function in type 2 di diabetes, at least two that I'm aware of. One of them, the walnut study, was done by the Yale group, and they looked at, um, this was a free living study where walnuts were supplemented, about 56 grams per day, and it was a crossover study, lasting each period lasting eight weeks, and they measured FMD, and they saw a significant improvement in FMD. So that matches some of the, early, some of the other studies in different populations that walnuts improve endothelial function measured by FMD. The second study was a pistachio study that was done by Cyril Kendall and his group here, which Sheila and I were fortunate to be collaborators on, and we led the um, endopat portion on it. And I'm sorry, no, wrong pistachio study. <laughs> So this, this is our pistachio diabetes study again where um, we measured both FMD and endopat in our 30 adults with type 2 diabetes. This was again crossover controlled feeding four weeks each and we found no significant effect on either FMD or endopat. So mixed results there. And then I just want to briefly mention there are other ways of measuring endothelial function that are more easily done in larger cohort studies. And that is by looking at serum markers of endothelial activation or cellular adhesion molecules. But you can see, as I've just briefly summarized here, in both epidemiology and clinical trials, it's really mixed evidence. So it's not clear if nuts have a beneficial or um, no effect on these markers. All right, and just lastly, I want to briefly mention arterial stiffness. Arterial stiffness is another measure of vascular health that we're concerned about. The, basically, the problem with arterial stiffness is pulse waves travel through stiffer arteries faster than they travel through distensible arteries. Every time your heart beats, a pulse wave gets reflected out to the periphery of your body, and part of that pulse wave gets reflected back to your heart. In the absence of arterial stiffness, that reflection comes back during diastole, where it's able to boost diastolic pressure in the heart, and that's when the coronary muscle itself gets perfused with oxygenated blood. In the presence of stiff arteries, the initial pulse wave goes out faster, it comes back faster, and it hits the heart during systole, so it augments central systolic pressure and then can also lead to ischemia during diastole because that pulse wave came back too soon. 
We can measure arterial stiffness by looking at that augment, augmented pressure, so how much, central, how much systolic pressure is increased because of this incident wave. As you can imagine, a greater augmentation index indicates greater stiffness. An alternative way of looking at this is to measure pulse wave velocity, literally the speed at which the pulse waves travel through the body. It's most commonly done by measuring waves form at the carotid and femoral artery simultaneously, and then simply calculating out distance over time to get velocity. And again, a greater velocity indicates greater stiffness. I'm just going to summarize these quick because we're just about done that um, there have been two studies that I'm aware of looking at nuts in arterial stiffness. Both of them were done with pistachios. One was done in India, and this one was the one that was done by Cyril Kendall's group here in Toronto. And um, the first one did find an increase. The study in India did find a reduction in pulse wave velocity, but we found no effect on using endopat in Cyril's study here. So evidence is still mixed, but this is relatively new technology, so it's not surprising. So just to summarize, there, are, there is emerging evidence that nuts can reduce ambulatory blood pressure, and this is particularly important because the clinic blood pressure readings have not been shown to be very strong. It may reduce total peripheral resistance, but there's a compensatory increase in cardiac output. And even there, it's hard to say which one came first. Are the nuts no lowering cardiac output or stroke volume, and TPR goes down, or TPR changes, or does it go the other way around, which one comes first? There is some indication that nuts can improve endothelial function, specifically when measured by flow-mediated dilation. I'm not going to go into the mechanisms. The previous speaker did a wonderful job of overviewing that. I'm just going to say that some of the mechanisms that um, have purportedly been involved in this would be the unsaturated fats, and specifically the magnesium and the potassium that may be lending to the vascular effects that we're seeing. So then I just want to close by acknowledging everyone that's been involved with the study and thank you for your time.